We have seen the American motion picture become foremost in all the world. We've seen it reflect our civilization throughout the rest of the world. The aims and the aspirations and the ideals of a free people and of freedom itself. The motion picture industry has utilized its vast resources, resources of talent and facilities, in a sincere effort to help the dictators, those who enforce the totalitarian form. It's a dangerous thing for their unfortunate peoples to know that in our democracy, officers of the government are the servants and never the masters of the people. Thank uh, you very much, sir. It's a great thrill to me to receive in the picture you did called Philadelphia Story. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Fontaine. I don't know how to express my gratitude. I don't know how it happened, but I have it in my hand, but I have. And I'm indeed grateful. And this is the greatest moment of my life. Thank you. They're off. At the break, it's Royal Crusader going to the front. The beautiful is second. The Bayview is next on the outside. Hysterical is moving up. And the Meal End and Porter's Cap are racing close up. Coming by the stand the first time, it's Bayview in front. By a head, Sweet Light is second on the outside. By a half a length, Hysterical is third on the rail. By a half a length, Porter's Cap is next and moving up on the outside. By a half a length, Woof Woof. By a length and a half, Can't Wait. And the Beautiful on the rail. Around the turn, it's Bayview still in front. By a one length, Sweet Light is second. By a head, Porter's Cap is third on the outside. Bayview in front on the inside. By a ahead, a sweep height is second by a one length, Porter's Cap is third by a head, Camp Wade is fourth on the outside by one length, by County is next on the rail by a head, Hysterical by a length and a half and there goes Mia Land and General Manager on the outside into the stretch and it's Bayview in front by a length and a half, Mia Land is second by a length and a half, Sweep Height is third by a head, Hysterical is next on the inside, into the stretch, and it's Bayview in front under the whip by a half a length. Mia Land is second and driving on the outside, and there comes Bolingbrook. It's Bayview and the Mia Land. It's Bayview and Mia Land is going to be a driving finish as they come across the line. It's Bayview by a half a length. Mia Land is second by four lengths, and Bayview, a 50 to 1 shot, is the winner. Hawks, which discovered too late that the British pilot planes of these once proud birds of the hills of desert, pock marked Benjamin machines, was vaunted field finds of sand which will soon give attack upon Tobruk, which broke the defenders' resistance in a mass. Space between them and their objective of stores and ammunition holes. Italian soldiery and sub bombardment, to Brook is uncannily silent. As our troops the render is complete. All fight has gone out of the rest of our forces is uninterrupted.
Now, did I say they looked a relieved crowd? Look at their broad smiles as they anticipate a free holiday for the duration. Go it in company with their regimental mascot. And, of course, there's yet another reason for their smile, expression on the faces of these Italian women. Benito Mussolini Street has got it where the chicken got the axe. This is naval and military, almost beam at the camera as a British officer invites them to pose for this picture. Months ago, their Libyan magician, the disappearing Graziani, promised they should go, but could be fairer than that. Their feet are on the prisoner's way, not on that victim. These four generals include divisional commanders, the first big batch of prisoners to arrive in Bombay on their way to an internment camp, and their first attack, and fought in a manner to make... The British troops bear no ill will towards... The Italian soldier has been led into... General MacArthur springs another surprise on the groggy Jap forces. Men of the 1st Cavalry get set to go ashore on Los Negros Island in the Admiralties. First, naval guns shell Jap batteries on the island, driving the enemy inland. As landing parties head for the channel, our planes bomb Jap position. This is part of the combined Pacific drive that has almost completely shut off 72,000 Japs from their home bases. The capture of Los Negros bypasses Rabaul and further neutralizes that important sea and air base. The island contains a vital airstrip and places MacArthur's forces many miles closer to the Philippines. Signal Corps pictures show the general inspecting the strategic prize. Over 3,000 Japs killed and wounded. We lost 61 killed and 244 wounded. General MacArthur congratulates the troops. His message to them was, hold on to what you take. Simo and Madame Chong Kai-shek inspect the Composite Wing, a unit of young Chinese airmen trained in the United States and under the command of both American and Chinese officers. Already at work bombing Jap shipping along the China coast, these native pilots are destined to play an important role when we carry the war to the Japanese homeland. To the madam, it's a dream come true, for she has been one of the wing's guiding lights. These young men, American trained and with American planes, will wreak sweet revenge on the invader. Gung-ho, they work together. With Berlin in ashes, a desperate Luftwaffe strikes back at London with telling effect. One bomb did this. Use your imagination for Berlin. The king and queen visit bomb victims. And a chicken's a chicken these days. What a terrific anti-aircraft barrage and night fighters make the raiders pay. It'll take more than this to halt the winning Britain. Routine adoptions are news, but when 20 adoption papers attest the fact that a couple took that number under their wing, it's front page stuff. Wilbur Arkea and his wife have legally adopted 20 Alaskan Indian children. 
and take in their stride the problem of feeding them and keeping track of all these ration books. The foster father, part Iroquois, works as a missionary in Alaska, caring for as many as 50 children at a time. And now he works hard and long at his art of hand-tooling leather to keep this table supplied. Ranging from two years to 18, all these kids can agree on one thing for sure. That's our pop. RDX, most powerful explosive in existence. More deadly than TNT. It's so dangerous in the raw state that it must be stored underwater. The ballistic mortar reveals the comparative forces. RDX was known both to the Axis and the Allies, but it remained for the Allies to harness it as shown at a Canadian military laboratory. A few ounces to be tested on a tree. Powerful medicine for the Axis. In response to the waste paper salvage drive, huge trucks loaded with bales of waste paper roll up to paper mills like McEwen Brothers in Whippany, New Jersey every day. So it's into the vat for the old paper and the reprocessing starts. This titanic paper making machine is turning old waste paper into nice new cardboard to help package material to be shipped to our many fronts. Like magic, the great machine does its job. And you help in the waste paper campaign which makes this possible. Keep it up. <laughs> Ruth Reeser, directress of the Venita League, judges winning hairdos at the league's first annual hair style show in New York. This smoothie was designed for women in civilian volunteer war work. Easy to groom, yet smart. The winning hairdo, styled for women in the armed services. The object of the contest was to discover the best coiffures from the standpoint of beauty, simplicity, and ease of grooming. Safety for defense workers. The seventh column, a sleek hairdo that will fit snugly under helmets worn in war plants, preventing accidents. For the Red Cross last. A worthy cause, remember? And with a seagoing tilt, we say, Ahoy! For the first time in naval history, two sponsors, Mrs. Angelina Bertera and Miss Nora McCurley, jointly sponsor a warship. It's the USS Springfield, named for Mrs. Bertera's hometown in Massachusetts, and Miss McCurley's hometown of the same name in Illinois. A cruiser of the Cleveland class, 10,000 tons, the Springfield will have the proud task of bringing honor to two cities. Nemesis of the U-boat, the blimp has played an important role in keeping our sea lanes open. And today, 10 of the training type go aloft for mass maneuvers. They are being manned by cadet pilots who have completed their training here at Moffett Field, California. These smallest blimps are used only in training and plenty difficult to fly in formation because of the wind drift. These men go to sea in patrol blimps. So if there's a U-boat left along our coast, it had better duck for home.
Western Electric employees swell the growing total of striking workers throughout the country. Thousands of New York telegraph workers also walk out and picket Western Union buildings, crippling telegraphic communications. Less than 15% of messages are being handled in the New York area. Although the strike was conducted in an orderly manner, police occasionally have to use persuasion to pass an unaffected employee through the picket line. Orders to the pickets and instructions are relayed from sound trucks. Sympathy demonstrations have disrupted a great portion of transatlantic traffic received in New York. But in Detroit, the labor picture has a brighter side. A new management labor pact is completed as Henry Kaiser affixes his signature to the agreement under which cars will be built at the former Willow Run plant. UAW leader signed for the workers, Joseph Fraser, Kaiser's partner, voices satisfaction. The negotiations which have just been concluded were carried on in the greatest spirit of friendliness and mutual understanding. And at Willow Run, we look forward to long years of peace and harmony in the production of our fine transportation for the peoples of the world. This desolated home in Chicago's fashionable Edgewater district was the scene of one of the most brutal crimes in police history the kidnapping of pretty six-year-old Suzanne Degnan. In the early hours of the morning, the innocent girl was taken from her bedroom and spirited away by a maniacal killer who later dismembered her childish body. In a desperate appeal to the heartless fiend, Suzanne's father broadcast a reply to the demand for $20,000 ransom. But even while his anguished message was being radioed, police were combing the neighborhood for traces of the crime and its perpetrator. In this catch basin was found little Suzanne's severed head. Searchers dig through trash bins looking for other parts of the tiny body. The grim search continues while the entire city goes on a manhunt, vowing vengeance on the slayer of the ravaged child. A throng gathers at New York's Pennsylvania station to welcome the legendary Coast Guard mascot, Sinbad. Most famous sailor aboard the Cutter Campbell for the past eight years, he has traveled more than a million miles, hitting port in all parts of the globe. But everybody needs a medical checkup, especially Sinbad, noted far and wide for his rum and beer drinking habits. But it's enough mates to bore you to death. Sinbad studies a map of his travels, which appears in his biography, before calling on Admiral Edward Smith. But Sinbad has little use for officers and will only drink with enlisted men like himself. Do you think on the morning after he needs the hair of the man who bit him? One thousand members of the motion picture industry gather to honor Ted Gamble, retiring head of the War Finance Division of the Treasury Department. In New York, the man who headed eight bond drives is presented with a silver cigar box by George Schaefer. One hundred and fifty billion dollars worth of bonds is his sales record. In reply, Mr. Gamble pays high tribute to the motion picture industry. Motion pictures are our most numerous and effective ambassadors. The artistry and genius that has made celluloid a weapon, in a weapon of war must turn its power in the creation of weapons of peace. This is not a choice for us. This is a stark injunction to follow the only course open to us. We will have one world or we will have no world. This industry, with its drive and courage, must take on the greatest sales job ever conceived. This industry must channel the greatest of all forms of expression to bring to practical realization the great ideals of brotherhood, of tolerance, of freedom, and of democracy. Goods destined for occupation troops in Japan go up in smoke as fire races through an 8th Army warehouse in Yokohama. Within 10 minutes after the blaze was discovered, the building was a raging inferno and little could be done to salvage any of the stock. Watches, pens, 
cigarette lighters, athletic equipment, and games were included in the loss. Fortunately, no one was injured, and the men are amply supplied with essentials until new goods can be shipped from the United States. Japanese joined with Americans in battling the blaze that proved so costly to Uncle Sam. Ben Hogan tees off in a desperate effort to pull ahead of Byron Nelson in the $13,000 Los Angeles Open Golf Tournament, attended by a record crowd of 30,000. Dutch Harrison winds up a long one that just misses coming in seven strokes behind the winner. Jimmy Demerit tries a 30-footer that is perfect. Lord Byron, after cracking the outgoing nine in a par 35, can afford to blow one. His three-stroke lead is increased to five by the time he sinks that winning putt. $2,666 in victory bonds, not to mention the 67 cents of the victor's award. But top prize is for free from this charming golf enthusiast. session to discuss the Russian-Iranian situation. Andrei Gromyko, Russian representative, acting on orders from Moscow, awaits the decision of the council, while Hussein Allah, Iranian ambassador, bides his time to voice his complaint. The entire assembly is tense as Gromyko speaks. When he finishes, a vote is taken on whether or not the Iranian question shall be brought before the council. Gromyko opposes immediate consideration of the issue, stating that Russia and Iran have reached an understanding. Poland sides with Russia, and with the vote 9 to 2 against deferment, Andrei Gromyko, with his aide, stalks from the council chamber. This is the climax to the meeting convened to preserve world unity. The Russians leave, vowing not to participate in any discussion that concerns the Iranian question at this time. With the Russian position left unoccupied, the meeting continues while the representatives prepare to consider Iran's presentation. The Iranian delegate, after Russia's withdrawal, presents Iran's case to the Security Council. While the entire assembly weighs each word, the Iranian ambassador, Hussein Allah, denies that his country made any binding military or commercial commitments with the Soviet government. I realize that the question of whether to proceed at once or to delay is a matter for the council to decide. For my part, I am prepared, pursuant to my instructions, to proceed with the presentation of the disputes which unfortunately have divided my country and its northern neighbor. I consider it necessary to do so at the earliest opportunity. And may I say once for all that I know of no agreement or understanding, secret or otherwise, having been entered into between my government and the Soviet Union with respect to any of the matters involved in the disputes now referred to this council. Iran has suffered and is at this moment suffering from interference in its internal affairs through the intervention of Soviet agents, Soviet officials, and armed forces. The presence of foreign forces in any country constitutes not only an infringement of the sovereignty, but also a heavy burden on the people and an interference in their daily life. The seriousness with which the people all over the world, as well as the people of Iran, regard this state of affairs is testimony to the fact 
the delay in the settlement of this dispute is a threat to world peace. In Tokyo, General MacArthur welcomes a distinguished visitor from New York. Former police commissioner Louis J. Valentine assumes a new role, that of streamlining and modernizing Japan's police setup. His first official act is to inspect the traffic problem. Later, he'll give crime busting the benefits of his New York technique. He'll put the nip into Nippon. The Navy draws the veil of secrecy from another wartime winner. An aerial television camera is loaded into a test plane for a series of striking tests at Anacostia. Special aerials serve the electronic camera, which is mounted in the nose of the plane. The test is on. Far from its base, the flying eye photographs and transmits its pictures of targets and objectives by one of the most compact television transmitters yet developed. The camera is aimed at a desired objective, and at Anacostia, 40 miles away in the television room, an image takes shape on the screen. The picture of a dock is brought right into the staff room. It was this kind of information that led to the sinking of several Jap ships in the Pacific. In actual war, this powerhouse could have been seen and written off by commanders as far away as 200 miles. Not even the nation's capital can hide from the flying eye. Another example of war-born genius. Happy Felton and some of his happy friends are going to give us the word. The word about dunking. Donut dunking, that is. It's strictly from etiquette and all that, so listen closely. First, we see Happy himself fairly serene about the world in general, and dunking in particular. However, his neighbor prefers the grab-and-bite style. Don't be afraid of the donut. It can't bite back. Of course, if you're not sure, go after it with two hands. According to the word from the Dunking Association Conclave in New York, compounding a felony is the only thing that's taboo, along with spilling on the old lady's new tablecloth. Okay, so she hasn't got a tablecloth. <laughs> For the swanky soiree, Happy recommends injured innocence, or the close-to-chest sneak. This is especially apt for fugitives from household justice, introverts, and Happy Felton, who makes dunking as exciting as taking candy away from baby. Shh, somebody's looking. The Sporting Lens focuses on ping pong. The nation's devotees of paddle and ball get underway in the U.S. Table Tennis Championships at St. Nicholas Arena in New York City. All ages and both sexes are out to win national honors. And the eliminations are jammed with excitement and some trick stuff that takes my breath away. Laszlo Belak is a worthy opponent. In fact, he's dexterous, ambidextrous, and petty dexterous. If you give him an inch, he'll take a foot. Nice footwork, Laszlo. The results are spectacular and almost unbeatable. All the opposition has to do is keep banging away. And that's my cue to move on to the next table, where a couple of table tennis titans are making it tough for the poor umpire. Steady there now, old man. He's not sure who's ahead or who's who. For that matter, who is ahead? Say, keep your eye on that ball. Five hundred proud members of the 442nd Infantry Regiment, mostly American-born Japanese, brings down Constitution Avenue in Washington for another ceremony in their honor. There are 3,600 Purple Hearts in this outfit, earned in the bitter battles of Salerno and Anzio. And these I march smartly onto the ellipse near the White House, where President Truman, Secretary Patterson, and Admiral Leahy are gathered. Regimental colors are brought forward to receive the eighth presidential unit citation held by the 442nd. Nisai, hear President Truman's tribute. 
You fought not only the enemy, but you fought prejudice, and you've won. Keep up that fight, and we'll continue to win. So make this great republic stand for just what it cons its constitution says it stands for, the welfare of all the people all the time. These soldiers, true Americans. <laughs> The picturesque royal palace at Bangkok in Siam is the scene of a mysterious shooting which caused the death of the 20-year-old ruler, King Ananda Mahidol. People gathered to read the death notice of a popular young monarch who reigned since 1935. The death of the quiet, studious young king was variously attributed to accident, suicide, or assassination. Officials examined the Colt 45 which fired the bullet through his brain in these sleeping quarters. In the throne room, Fabulously rich in gold and jewels, the dead monarch's remains are guarded by Buddhist priests. Succeeding the late king is his brother and constant companion, Pumi Pona Duldet, here paying his respects. Peace to the ashes of a well-loved ruler. At Lakehurst, New Jersey, men of the Navy march in review and blimps dip and salute as the Navy's lighter-than-air pioneer terminates 32 years of naval service. Admiral Charles Rosendahl retires with full military honors with the thanks of a nation for the role he played in the development of dirigibles and blimps. His flag comes down in front of the hangar originally built to house the ill-fated Shenandoah. Admiral Rosendahl was a lieutenant when he survived the crash of the big airship 23 years ago. Although he is retiring, he intends to devote his interest and energy towards the continued development to its needs. Among the hosts of movie celebrities flocking to Portland, Oregon, are producer Walter Wanger and his wife, Joan Bennett. And no party would be complete without genial Lou Costello to lend a laugh. The Hollywood crowd is treated to a royal welcome, a staged manhunt, and a real wild western jubilee. Big Chief Costello goes into his war dance as the Tom Tom throb and the monster parade led by Governor Snell of Oregon ushers in the world premiere of Universal's Technicolor production, Canyon Passage. The picture deals with Oregon's early history and the whole state gives it a rousing greeting. 